When I first started flying, one of the first questions I would ask potential schools was, how much should I expect to spend to get my private pilot certificate? How long is it going to take? Reasonable questions when undertaking such a commitment as getting your pilot certificate. But I always got the same answer. How much you spend depends on how prepared you are when you show up. And frustrating as that was, and difficult as that made budgeting and planning for my pilot certificates, they were right. They would recommend for me to chair fly, to rehearse procedures, visualize going through checklists in the most realistic and detailed way possible. Practice flows in my head, and that's great advice. But how was I supposed to do that? How could I accurately and correctly chair fly if I'm not familiar and I don't fully understand the airplane and the procedures yet? If you're not familiar with the panel, if you don't know where the controls are or what each item on the checklist is actually asking you to do, you're just going through the motions and potentially the wrong ones creating a foundation of bad habits that you will later need to unlearn. And that's not helpful. It actually costs you more time and more money. I remember showing up to lessons and spending the first 15 or 20 minutes just getting my bearings, trying to find switches, figuring out what I was really looking at and looking for, learning to read instruments I've never seen before. And all of that, I was paying a hefty price tag for. If I had had something like a detailed, calm, step-by-step -step cockpit walkthrough I could go back to any time, I would have saved hours of paid flight time and many thousands of dollars. So I'm creating this series for you to give you what I wish I had had when I was starting out. In this video, we'll walk through the entire Cessna 172 cockpit and break down each section, each system, and each control in a way that's clear and practical. So when you show up to fly, whether it's your first lesson or your 10th, you're not just trying to keep up, you're ready. Let's get started. Before the engine starts, before the checklist begins, we need to take a moment to understand the space we're in. This is the cockpit of a Cessna 172 Sierra model. Steam gauges and fuel injected. Let's walk through where everything is, what it does, and how it fits into your flow as a pilot. Let's begin left to right. Left side of the panel, we have switches and startup controls. We're going to remove the yoke with the press of a button here just so that we can see better. And we've got our master switch that says BAT and ALT. This powers the electrical system. BAT activates the battery and ALT engages the alternator once the engine is running. Then we've got the avionics master over here. It's always off during engine start to protect sensitive avionics. We turn it on after the engine is stable. Next, we've got the ignition slash magneto switch with the off, right, left, both, and start positions. You'll use both in flight for redundancy and start when we engage the engine. On the center pedestal, you'll find two engine controls. The first is the throttle, which is this black knob. You push in to increase power, and you pull to reduce. This controls your engine RPM, or revolutions per minute. The silver disc at the base of the throttle is the friction lock. It controls how tightly the lever stays in place. If it's too loose, the throttle can creep back on its own during flight. If it's too tight, you'll struggle to make smooth adjustments. You turn it clockwise to tighten it and counterclockwise to loosen it. We set it so that the throttle stays where you put it, but is still easy enough to move when you need to. Here we have our tachometer that shows you your RPMs, which is your primary power indicator. This red knob is the mixer control and it adjusts how much fuel is mixed with air going into the engine. Pushing it in brings it to full ridge, which gives the engine more fuel, which you normally need for takeoff, landing, and low altitudes. 
Pulling it out leans the mixture or reduces the amount of fuel. It's important at higher altitudes where there's less air density. You can also fine tune the mixture by turning the knob clockwise to richen or counterclockwise to lean. The trim wheel adjusts the neutral position of the elevator, which helps relieve control pressure on the yoke. Roll it back to trim nose up, roll it forward to trim nose down. Set your pitch with the yoke then trim to relieve the pressure the goal is to keep the airplane flying where you want it hands off these are your radios and your navigational signal receivers you'll use your communication radios to talk to atc flight service or other aircraft you can monitor one frequency while transmitting on the other the navigation receivers receive signals from ground-based nav aids like vors and ils systems they work with your navigation instruments to help you track courses radials or glide slope this also has your GPS, navigation display, and moving map. Below that, you have your transponder. This sends a signal to ATC radar. You'll be assigned a four-digit squawk code and set it in your transponder. In mode C, or ALT, it also transmits your altitude so controllers can see you accurately on your screen. Your transponder is required in certain types of airspace. Right below that is your autopilot. Panel lighting knobs or sliders are over here. They control glare shield, floodlights, pedestal illumination, and radio backlighting. We really want to know how to use these for nighttime operations so that we're not fumbling for lighting in the dark. Let's not forget our alternate static source. It's this small pull knob under the panel. We use it only if the primary static port becomes blocked. It supplies cabin pressure to instruments like the altimeter, vertical speed indicator, and airspeed indicator in an emergency. And just down here, we have our handheld microphone. Most instructors and students use headsets. I've never used a handheld microphone in a Cessna in my life. But either way, that's what it is. There's a handheld microphone and there's push to talk buttons on the yoke right over here. We press this when we want to talk and transmit. And right down over here, we have a fuel shutoff valve. It's red and located near the fuel selector. And this is separate from the fuel selector that has the alternative for left, right, or both. This one is only used in emergency procedures, such as in engine fire. We never touch this during normal operations. Next, we have our digital clock, which is used for timing patterns, holds, and instrument procedures. And this one also has a voltmeter that displays the charging system health and battery voltage. Also very important are our air vents. It's especially important in the summer in Florida or California, but they are found overhead and you can rotate them to open or close them and aim them as needed. Over here, we have the lighting panel, controls for beacon, landing, taxi light, nav lights, strobe lights and pedo heat. We use the pedo heat for icing condition and that heats up the pedo tube. Next we have the six pack, which are the primary flight instruments. We have the airspeed indicator, which shows you the indicated airspeed, not your ground speed. And these colored arcs are actually a bit of a cheat sheet. This white arc shows you the flap operating range, so you should never lower your flaps when you're above this speed and it's marked right here. Then you've got the green arc which is your normal flight range, your yellow arc, which is the caution zone. And you should only fly in this zone in smooth air only. Then we've got the red line, which is your never exceed speed.
Next, we've got the attitude indicator, which is your artificial horizon, and it's critical in low visibility. You align the miniature airplane on your horizon. The background has blue for the sky and brown for the ground, and it moves to show your pitch and bang. You have these pitch tick marks every five degrees. You can see five, ten, 15, 20, 25. You also have the bank arc with tick marks at 10, 20, 30, and 60 degrees. It's powered by the vacuum system, as you can see, and driven by a gyroscope. We use it to confirm that we're straight and level, climbing at a known pitch, or turning at a known bank angle. Next, we have the altimeter. It reads altitude above sea level, and it uses atmospheric pressure. First, we set the local pressure here in the Colesman window. We get that from our ATIS normally. The large hand shows you hundreds of feet, the short hand thousands, and the skinny one tenths. After that, we move on to our turn coordinator, which displays the rate of turn and the coordination. The mini airplane banks left and right to show your rate of turn. When its wingtips align with the tick marks, you're in a standard rate turn, which is three degrees per second. The ball or inclinometer shows your coordination. If it's off center, you have to press the rudder pedal. We normally say step on the ball to remember how to follow it. If the ball is deflected to the right, you want to apply right rudder. And if the ball is deflected to the left, we apply left rudder. After that, we have our heading indicator. It looks like a compass, but it isn't. This is a directional gyro, and it's powered by the vacuum system as well. Unlike the magnetic compass, it provides a stable heading reference, but it drifts over time due to gyroscopic precession and internal friction. That's why you need to realign it every 15 minutes in flight using the magnetic compass as your reference. Do it in level unaccelerated flight for best accuracy. And unaccelerated flight means you are at a stable speed, not accelerating or decelerating. Next, we have our vertical speed indicator, or VSI. This shows your climb or descent rate in thousands of feet per minute, based on pressure changes over time. It has a slight lag of about six to nine seconds. We use it to verify that we're climbing or descending, not to initiate it. Next, over this way, you have your oil pressure and oil temperature gauges, and we watch these during engine start and climb. We look to see that we are in the green. At first, the temperature will be low and it will climb, but the oil pressure should be in the green arc pretty quickly after you start the engine. Next, we've got our fuel gauges to see how much fuel we have in each tank, left and right. Our EGT, which is our exhaust gas temperature, and it helps you with your mixture management to make sure that you have the correct mixture. And also, you have the ammeter and voltmeter. It shows whether you are charging or discharging, and also your vacuum pressure. This lets you know that your vacuum-powered instruments will be working correctly when your vacuum gauge is around 5, but just within this green little arc. Now we move on to where you also have the cabin heat for when you're flying on cold days and don't want to freeze your butt off. Next we have our control yoke and rudder pedals. The yoke moves the elevator and the aileron. If you push it forward, your nose will go down because it makes the elevator move. When you pull back, it pulls your nose up as a function of the elevator moving as well. 
Then if you turn it left or right, it controls the bank by raising one aileron and lowering the other. Just remember that if you turn the yoke to the right, you will bank right. The rudder pedals control yaw and they act as toe brakes on the ground when you press the top part of the pedal. They also steer the airplane on the ground. When you turn the airplane in flight, you use a combination of yaw and bank. You don't just bank, you want to make sure that your turn is coordinated and in order for your turn to be coordinated, you have to use both your rudder pedal and your bank angle. Make sure that ball is centered in your turn coordinator. Now over here in the center panel, you have your fuel selector valve on the floor, which has left, right, or both. During normal operations in this airplane, we normally keep it set to both. And that means it's getting fuel fed from both tanks. Next, we have our flap lever that shows 10, 20, or 30 degrees of bang. It's electrically actuated and we use as required during takeoff and landing. Normally, we use our flaps for landing to allow us to fly at a slower airspeed. Over here, we have our circuit breakers and we always check these if the system isn't functioning. And we don't reset one in flight unless we're sure it's safe to do so. And we always do that by following our checklists. If you've made it this far, congratulations! You now have a clear picture of how a Cessna 172 cockpit is laid out. You know what you're looking for when you sit down, you understand what each instrument and system is for, and you've started to build the foundation for your own cockpit flow so that checklists aren't just something you read, but something you do with confidence. This is a huge first step and one most students only get after several hours of paid flight time, but you're doing the smart thing, preparing on your own time so your lessons can be about flying, not just catching up to the airplane. In the next video, we'll take everything we just learned and put it into action with a full walkthrough of the pre-flight inspection, the engine start procedure, and taxi to the active run checklist in hand step by step with explanations at every stage. And after that, we'll perform a takeoff and fly a full lap around the traffic pattern, giving you the full experience from engine startup to landing. My goal is to help you show up feeling ready and to build confidence as a pilot. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and keep this video saved as a reference. You'll get more out of it each time you come back. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.